Hello, thank you for joining us for this brief video today on identifying signs of literacy struggle. There are a wide variety of risk factors and signs that families can be on the lookout for in their children beginning in the preschool years and on into elementary school. We have a checklist here and it's linked in the slides and the slides will be shared along with this video. This is an early identification checklist. So it allows families to think about family history and the child's past development in those years before starting formal kindergarten, first grade education and things that may place them at uh, risk and can be seen as red flags, things to watch out for as signs that the child could struggle with later literacy development. Family history is one of the items on that list. It's at the very top and it's a very important one. Here we have linked an article about the importance of family history and dyslexia. And this graphic was taken from that research article. Over on the left, um, the blue and green. So if someone does not have a familial risk of dyslexia, of a reading disorder, it places their likelihood of developing a reading disorder around eight to 16 percent. Note here though, uh, the red and orange visual, if someone does have a family history of dyslexia, such as a parent or a sibling who struggled to learn to read or write, whether it was diagnosed or not, notice that that person with a familial risk has a 34 to 54% chance um, of developing risk of developing a reading disorder. So knowing that family history is very important. Once a child starts school, so you've, you've taken into account family history, you've noted things in the child's early development, such as did they struggle with speech or did they struggle with language skills at all? Did they struggle learning their letters or numbers or colors or shapes when they were in preschool or playing and interacting with you at home, et cetera? Right. Take those things into account as the child enters into elementary school. All public schools in North Carolina require the Dibbles literacy assessment to be given three times a year, kindergarten through third grade. And we have a link here to a workshop that goes into great detail, um, understanding the literacy screenings that are done in the public schools and how to interpret those results and what follow-up should look like. But here, this is just an example of the um, Dibbles report, uh, the first page of that report that would come home to families uh, beginning, middle, and end of year. And notice for this student, we have a variety of the skills in red, and that is labeled as meaning the child needs most support and the child is well below benchmark. The Dibbles screener, again, the workshop goes into a lot more detail, but it looks at um, this, and this was a first grader, um, is looking at their letter naming ability, their phonemic awareness skills, um, which is a um, big predictor of dyslexia. It's looking at a student's ability to pull apart and manipulate the sounds in words. It's looking at a student's ability to read nonsense words. So um, identify the sounds and then blend together nonsense words. It looks at their ability to read real words um, with both accuracy and fluency. And then there are also subtests that look at uh, oral language and vocabulary skills. So this student is showing signs of struggle across a variety of these literacy skill areas. Also note at the top, 
the student will receive a composite score. It's sort of their total score for the whole screener. And notice it's circled in red as being well below benchmark. And this is 375. On the next screen, um, I have a link to, this is North Carolina's Read to Achieve document. Um, the uh, programs and um, processes they have put in shape, uh, put in place to support reading development across public schools in North Carolina. But on page 88, there's a benchmark cut score. And this applies to that Dibble screener. This student, this was a middle of year screening for a first grader. They had a 375. First grade, middle of year, the cut off, the cut point was 389. So that 375 was below the cutoff point, meaning that the student is in um, is at risk for struggling, right? Because if they are at or above that cutoff point, they are at minimal risk, at least um, per what was looked at on that one screening assessment. So I, I have that link to you as well to help you um, understand the um, benchmark scores. Now, even though Dibbles is required, this screener is required statewide, kindergarten through third grade in public schools, your public elementary school may include other supplemental reading and screening assessments. They may do that in addition to Dibbles. One of these that you may see in your district is the iReady reading assessment. This is a reading comprehension assessment um, and looks at, again, a variety of, of areas such as phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension. And again, this was a, uh, a first graders report. You're seeing their performance at beginning of year in August and then towards end of year in spring in April. This child, um, even by spring, is labeled as approaching grade one. So they are not meeting grade one standards, even though they are about to wrap up first grade. Again, that is a sign of a, a child who may be struggling. Um, something else to note on the iReady, sometimes it may be seen on the Dibble screener. You may see something called a Lexile reading measure. And I've got more information about that on the next page. So I have a link to the Lexile site to give you more information. But in essence, the Lexile uh, reading level is an attempt to quantify um, the both the level of books, the difficulty complexity level of books, and the reading level of individual students and readers. Um, again, this student was a Spring first grader, their Lexile is BR210. BR means beginning reader. And I went to this Lexile grade level chart, and you'll notice that a 210 beginning reader is around kindergarten level springtime. So kindergartner in the spring, if they're at the 50th percentile, kind of middle of the road, they're around a beginning reader 160. And our student was a beginning reader 210. So not much above that. And they are a whole grade level above. Again, another piece of evidence, another sign that this child is struggling. Another screener that you may see in addition to Dibbles, or you may not, is the Renaissance Star Screener. Um, this is also a reading comprehension assessment. And um, it, in essence, the student is reading passages and answering multiple choice questions. And it is adaptive. So depending on how the child responds to the questions, they may then get a slightly harder passage or they may get an easier passage. So it adapts to, um, to their abilities. And again, similar to the Dibbles color coding, red means the child is below standard, is showing that they may be struggling. Yellow shows that they are, you know, approaching 
they're they're working on meeting that standard. And the STAR report will break down different areas of reading comprehension, such as can the child identify, right, the, the main idea, the details. Um, how does the child do understanding the structure of a passage, for example? And it will then give them a score in each of those areas. So those are all screeners that you may see come home um, beginning, middle, end of year for your student. They, they may be seen, the Dibble screener, remember, is, is mandated kindergarten through third, though you may see some of these screeners, the Dibbles, the STAR, the I ready um, come home in some capacity throughout elementary school, depending on your district. The um, end of grade reading tests are required, and I have a link here for more information. They are required statewide public schools for reading in grades three through eight. There are also end of grade assessments required for math and science. So you may see this come home um, beginning in third grade. There's a beginning of year, a beginning of third grade reading assessment, and then an end of third grade reading assessment, um, since third grade is um, considered a pretty pivotal year in that reading um, development trajectory. All right, and this is another source of great information. So seeing at that beginning of year or grades through, through three through eight end of year, how is my child um, matching up compared to their peers within the school, within the district and across the state? This was a third grade student end of year and you can see they were shown to be not consistent. They were showed inconsistent understanding of grade level content. Um, now, this isn't telling us, are they having trouble understand, pulling the words from the page, right? Decoding, reading the words on the page, or are they having trouble understanding the words that, that they're reading, or is it a combination of both? So we would need to look further at why they were struggling. And notice again, we're seeing that Lexile score again, that so this student is end of third grade, and it's giving them a Lexile score of around 445, <clears throat> which is roughly around spring of second grade. So placing them a year behind. Important thing to keep in mind, um, grades may or may not show signs of struggle um, and, and difficulty with literacy development. This was a first grader who in fact was um, struggling greatly to learn to read, write, and spell, but notice their language arts grade. They had an A first quarter, high B second quarter. So um, important to note that good grades are not a reason to deny support or special education. And we have um, federal law linked here that makes that um, crystal clear. This is a first grader um, again, and this was writing assignment. This was, um, there was a spelling test, the upper part of the page, and then they had to write sentences, the bottom part of the page. And this was something that came home in the child's bag pack. Um, hopefully you're seeing there are a lot of things going on and concerning things with this first grader's writing. Um, certainly uh, handwriting is not always beautiful and pristine um, by uh, winter, spring of first grade. Um, but we're seeing significant spacing issues, significant letter formation issues. Notice this backwards letter. I'm not sure if it's representing a C or some other letter. Um, we see quite a bit of erasing and re-attempts to form the letters. Um, and let's see, we've got sort of an extra letter there and significant spelling issues because I'm not able to legibly determine what the child was trying to write, right? The truck possibly took maim on a, maybe this is supposed to be trip. I, maybe this is a backward C, I can something yat, I yacht. 
I'm suspecting that this student is using a Y when they're really wanting potentially a W, maybe what I want. Um, notice in this last sentence, the second word I believe is supposed to be girl. So they're transposing some letters here. So keeping a close eye on those writing assignments and spelling tests that come home. This was the same student here, um, but this was months later. They've wrapped up first grade. They're about two weeks from entering second grade and um, they were given a writing task. It is essentially illegible. Um, spacing is a huge issue. Spelling is a huge issue. Um, there's just one period in the entire um, attempt, letter formation issues, um, lots of concerns. And um, as the person who administered this writing sample, I can tell you there was a lot of anxiety and stress. The student did not want to write this. They did. They said they couldn't do it. So a lot of encouragement was required even to get this on the page. So how do I know that writing like this, for example, or um, their reading is below where it should be? Well, we have a link here for you to go to North Carolina's document that shows the language arts standards grade by grade. And there are separate reading st standards and writing standards. Um, this is an example of the reading standards that students are supposed to master by the end of grade one. Um, I'll just point out a few things here. Notice they should be printing upper and lowercase letters legibly. They should be using capitalization and ending punctuation. Um, and it goes into detail on the what students should be able to do in terms of word reading and phonics skills, phonological awareness skills. They should be reading fluently um, on grade level text. So for grade first grade level text um, with appropriate understanding. Here is the writing strand for first grade and the students writing samples that we were just looking at do did not meet these at all. Um, and they're moving in now to second grade with new standards. So by the end of first grade, in essence, a student should be able to write opinion, informative and narrative pieces with um, some elements of a beginning, middle and end, some, some support statements. Right. Uh, well, that student we were looking at those samples, he he is um, far from that um, going into second grade. So you can look at what is coming home. What is my child doing in terms of reading and writing? And is that matching up with where they should be? Um, this is also from that same uh, document linked here. Right. The the ELA standards. Um, there are even specific standards on capitalization and punctuation and spelling. So there are specific standards of where a child should be, what should be taught, what should be mastered by the end of each grade. Something else to consider um, as you are thinking about your child and their literacy development. How are they doing with home assignments? And I have a link here to a free homework chart you can download and I filled it in with a few um, facetious examples, but not unusual in elementary school, right? For a child to have to do some sentence writing, potentially to practice weekly vocabulary or spelling words and for them to have to read for 20 minutes a night. Um, and really taking note, how much support are they requiring of you to get the assignment done? How much time is it taking? Is it requiring a lot of coaxing, demanding, and support? Is there a lot of anxiety or emotion involved? Is there refusal happening? So keep keeping a homework a char chart, if that may be um, appropriate for your child and what you're observing. So starting to put it all together, there are a lot of things that we can be looking for as our child before they enter elementary school, once they're in elementary school and beyond, to be looking for 
risk flags and signs that they may be struggling. And again, I've got many of these listed here. Certainly this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some um, big items to consider. Um, and the article from which it came is, is linked here in um, the slides as well. And these are all things you would want to be gathering um, to share with a school um, to discuss if you are having concerns about your child. And so putting all of this together, consider and share risk factors with teachers. That very first early risk flags, early warning sign document I showed you. Think about that as your child is going into school and um, keep that in mind as they begin those elementary years and share any significant background history, family history, with the teacher. Closely monitor those screenings that come home, schoolwork that comes home, the child's response to homework. Be familiar with those grade level standards and know that you have the right to meet with your child's teachers to discuss concerns and possible need for extra support at any time. You have a right to request your student's records if you have misplaced some of those screeners and documents. And know that you always have the right to request a school assessment for special education at any time, whether they've received supplemental support or not. If you do submit a request for special education assessment, you are going to want to supply as many of these items on this list as you can to really educate the team as a whole on the concerns you're seeing, why you're bringing this up to the team, and to serve as evidence when you meet with the team. Hopefully that was some helpful information um, as you go with your child through their school journey. I know this was a lot of information um, and know that Decoding Dyslexia in North Carolina is always here to answer your questions. If you need further clarification on any of the slides or the links that are supplied, please reach out to us at decodingdyslexianc at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Decoding Dyslexia North Carolina, and we are happy to help at any time. Um, take care and best wishes. Thank you.